thank you everyone for joining us for a K through 12 online learning seminar featuring IGI Global's K through 12 online learning ebook collection. Um, to start off and put this a little bit in context for you, um, we really wanted to put together this seminar um, in light of the current pandemic um, and really focus on those K through 12 educators that now have to suddenly shift to online only environments. Um, as we know, teachers and educational professionals worldwide are being challenged you know, to quickly adapt to this new norm of education. As we know, a lot of the research within this field really focuses on higher education, um, looking at the adult learner. As we know, a lot of colleges and universities have had online education programs implemented into their institution for years. But now we're really seeing this quickly take place and take root within the K through 12 classroom settings. And teachers are really normally used to the face-to-face -face communication and are taught in the face-to-face -face education realm. So really now more than ever, there's an apparent need to provide professional materials and resources to these individuals to ensure that they're not only successful in this new environment, but are also able to foster their student success. So during this presentation, we'll be introducing our K through 12 online learning ebook collection um, that really contains the timeliest research that addresses and solves these challenges that K through 12 educators are facing. To start off, and talk a little bit about IGI Global, specifically in the realm of ed the education field. Um, as many of you may know, we have been a scientific research publisher for over 30 years, and that includes within the education realm. Um, we're really well known within education um, as actually one of the most sought after publishers within specifically education technology. Um, and this is due to our credibility of our research, which is backed by the Committee on Publication Ethics, also, we are an active member of the American Education Research Association. We go to their annual conference every single year, and we're really known for as that publisher who publishes the most emerging research within a specific field. Based on that, a lot of our resources are contributed by, but then also utilized by prestigious institutions. And this includes Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT, Harvard University, Stanford, University of Cambridge, University of Oxford, Tsinghua University, Australian National University, as well as international universities. However, it is important to kind of explain and talk about the fact that our scientific research really goes beyond, you know, the reference materials that we publish or our reference books, um, but it provides the latest concepts and methodologies to solve these real world problems that these K through 12 educators are facing, um, which making them ideal for professional development. To address some of our timeliest topics in education today, we've actually invited some of our leading authors and editors to speak on the current trends and future outlooks of K through 12 education. So with us today is Dr. Sally Brown, who is the Associate Professor of Literacy at Georgia Southern University and author of the IGI Global Publication, Digital Initiatives for Literacy Development in Elementary Classrooms. So really her, a lot of her research focuses around multimodal literacy, cloud-based writing, and then online practices of digital literacy and those K through 12 settings. We have Dr. Pam Epler, who is a professor and dissertation chair at Grand Canyon University. She is the author of numerous IGI Global publications, including one of our best-selling publications, Cases on Service Delivery and Special Education Programs. So really focusing her publication around and her research around real world instances and case studies on how to build a successful classroom for students with disabilities. We also have Dr. Linda Che Blankson, who is an associate professor in the Education Administration and Foundations Department at Illinois State University. She is an editor of a recent IGI Global publication, Emergent Techniques and Applications for Blended Learning in K through 20 Classrooms. And a lot of her research really covers, and her title covers, um, different things like gamification and technologies for blended learning. And lastly, we do have Dr. Cynthia Sistic Chandler, who is a professor and academic program director for advanced teacher practices at National University. Once again, she's published numerous IGI Global publications and is the editor of Exploring Online Learning Through Synchronous and Asynchronous Instruction Methods, which focuses on detailed research and designing and implementing online courses. 
She was actually just named 2020 Higher Education Technology Leader of the Year by EdTech Digest for her work in creating an adaptive learning environments. So they will provide insights today on how schools, teachers, parents, and students can really adapt to this new norm of education that the COVID-19 pandemic has brought. So to start off, I'd like to thank our speakers for joining us today. And we've lined up a few questions around our central theme. Okay, so to start off, Dr. Che Blankson, during the COVID-19 pandemic, so many K-12 educators have had to adapt to online learning with little to no experience. What have your observations been during the shift? And what do you think the top three challenges these educators are facing? Thank you so much for that question. Um, I will preface my answer by saying and by revealing that I am a mother of um, four. Three of my um, first, my kids are in high um, college and the last one is in high school. I'm also an educator who teaches online and most of my, uh, my students are teachers in the K-12 system. Now, what I have observed from interactions with my, my um, students and also with my children is this, that um, with our teachers, the most challenging things that they are facing within this COVID period of, you know, having them transition their information or their teaching to online settings is that, um, you just mentioned it, it's the experience, the lack of experience. When they went through their teacher education or with their training, there was no part of that training that included, you know, the use of technology and teaching in online settings. Everything was done in a face-to-face -face mode. And so now you have teachers who have been trained in a face-to-face -face setting, and we are asking them to immediately translate or transfer everything that they know into an online or a remote setting. And so that has been quite a challenge. The other challenge I would say is in, you know, just that the teacher responsibilities. We know that teachers are, um, you know, in, in, in teaching, they, they don't only teach their content, um, they also teach students in human development, right? And so then that aspect of, you know, training your, your students or helping them develop as individuals, you know, that social emotional piece of, you know, education is now something that they have to deal with, right? How do they do that with their students who they don't see face to face? And not only that, as human beings, how do they also take care of their emotional needs and also their mental needs, as well as take care of their families? Um, a third challenge, I would say, this is something that isn't um, new, but it was really, it's been really something that has been highlighted with this COVID situation in that, you know, we see the inequities in the educational system. We, we, we have these perceptions or we have these assumptions that we make about our children that everyone is tech savvy, right? Even with our one-on-one, -on -one, um, you know, technology policies that everyone has a, a laptop, a computer that they can work with. But we forget that when our children go home, there is that issue of maybe a student having lack of technology. So the teacher now has to deal with that as they are, are putting their materials online. The teacher themselves may be living in remote, you know, um, locations, they may have technology issues as well. So how do the, how, how um, do teachers, you know, go about uh, making their, their content available to their students in this kind of situation? Um, in my, my son's school, what some of the teachers have done, have they made packets available to their students, right? And then now the case is who's going to come and pick up those packets with um, those are some of the things that teachers have had to deal with. And um, those are the problems that I have observed or the challenges that I have, have observed with, within this COVID period. Dr. Sally Brown, in your opinion, what are some of the top challenges associated with engaging young learners, specifically in early childhood and pre-K um, in online settings? Also, based on your experience in online teaching, what are some recommendations you can offer to your colleagues? Well, I think one of the first challenges is teaching reading online. Um, while there's certainly lots of opportunities for students to listen to books being read online by various professionals, sports figures, and that type of thing, um, it is more of a challenge to get students to read independently, which is especially important in early childhood. So 
we want to think about that as a challenge and then to couple that with the joy and engagement of reading. In the classroom, um, relationships with students can guide this, but outside of the classroom, we have to think about how do we bring that joy to reading? How do we motivate students to read independently at home? And I think one of the things that we can do is remove um, assessments. We don't need to assess everything and to focus more on the content, enjoying the story. What did you take away from the story instead of giving a multiple choice quiz? And one of the recommendations I have is to use Epic Books, which is free for all public school educators. And they offer a nice variety of high quality literature that meets a lot of um, diversity standards in terms of types of characters, content, um, materials for low level learners, for gifted students, for English learners. Um, and I think that that can be one place that we look at. And then also in the classroom, students' um, literacy activities in early childhood are also tied a lot to drawing. And so if we can add in that image component, that drawing component to the teaching of reading online, that will help students engage and be motivated to participate. And one example of an author doing that is Mo Williams, who writes a lot of stories about a character named Pigeon. And he's doing some lunch um, lunchtime doodles on uh, YouTube. And to couple this with the reading of his books can be a very enjoyable experience for children where they not only are doing some reading, but some drawing. And that drawing um, may not be shared with the teacher, but it doesn't mean that it's not an integral part of the literacy experience with the book. Then looking at it from an overall holistic viewpoint, Dr. Epler, what recommendations do you have for educators switching to online learning from traditional classroom settings? Thank you for asking that question. I have several recommendations. First, I think teachers should attend any and all trainings that perhaps their school or perhaps the local colleges or universities are providing. Uh, I know in my university, we were offering all sorts of training um, sessions for um, our, own our own staff, but they also could be given to teachers in the area if that was needed. My other recommendation, another recommendation would be to get yourself some, a mentor or a buddy who is um, more knowledgeable perhaps or more experienced using online tools. Um, I do that with even my client. I've been teaching online for, oh goodness, many, many years, but I also learn new things. Our students also can help us with um, providing us with maybe some uh, software that we're not familiar with. They may be able to assist you. I also would suggest that you, uh, here in the state of Ohio, we actually, our Department of Education is actually offering trainings and on various types of software for teachers to use in various content areas. It's free and you can talk to uh, other people that have used the software uh, and also in some situations they actually let you uh, play with if you will the software experience it before you use it in your classroom. So you can find yourself someone who has maybe a little more knowledge than you do on with working with online. Uh, collaborate with your colleagues and find some training. I think that will be a good way to transition from the face-to-face -to -face online experience. Now, the next question is a lot more focused on, you know, as we're facing this turbulent time in and outside of the professional realm, in and outside the educational realm, um, a lot of teachers, educators are facing limited time and also limited resources. So Dr. Sistic Chandler, in your expert opinion, how can K through 12 educators effectively train and prepare themselves to better conduct their new role as an online educator or teacher and really become more effective during these challenging times? Well, I do have to start out by saying that I've been watching a lot of the blogs and a lot of the Twitter feeds and 
discussing this issue with colleagues and, and I believe that K-12 educators have been doing a yeoman's job of using web ref web conferencing tools such as Google Meet, Zoom, and Microsoft Teams, among others, really to connect with their students in real time. And a web camera, which allows the voice and video with all participants, really helps make that caring and emotional connection that establishes the bond with other humans. It's, it's you know, online learning needs to be a human experience. And that's what I keep emphasizing with my students in higher education. Um, we, we see that students are being comforted by knowing their teachers care about them and want to support them in this new paradigm of teaching and learning. And one note also is that we need to be very concerned about the, the trauma of this, that this kind of um, distancing is creating, uh, also uh, looking at our emotional well-being and that it should be paramount really to all of our social and educational interactions in this time. And being that I've been teaching online for 21 years, I've found that doing online education right is not really the overall goal here, but it's rather giving students the opportunity to talk and express themselves. Um, and that really should be the main objective. Um, and our, our educators are so qualified to have these critical conversations with students and having those interactions. So if educators do have web conferencing capabilities, this really opens the door to so many options for instruction, like group work, using breakout rooms, um, guiding our students step-by-step step through problem solving and exercises, and also really acting as a coach rather than the 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 sage on the stage that's imparting all this this great information out to students and um guiding them through these situations i think is really going to help and a real-time connection is the best way most of all i want to emphasize that screen time should really be balanced with creative authentic hands-on projects that intersect and support educational standards. And I see a lot of teachers who are reading aloud stories to lower primary students. Other elementary teachers are doing writer's workshop and guided writing. Uh, many are encouraging their students to keep a journal since this is really an unprecedented time in our history and that we'll look back to examine. And educators are rushing to the web to post assignments and resources for their students to explore. However, I'm hearing that many districts really are having students complete packets of work. And it's really, that's busy work. And while this is not deep learning, we are seeing parents rising up to be able to help their children in a homeschool environment. And they've really stepped up in this time. Some educators are embracing whatever technology they have at their disposal, whether it's an all call message uh, phone system like Remind or other communication systems, uh, picking up the telephone and talking to their students uh, on a conference call environment. Keeping in touch, in my opinion, should really be the catalyst for learning. And teaching online requires a whole different skill set than what most educators are used to. And from my experience, the best advice I can give is to go slow. And even if you just have one tool, like a Google document or Google Slides or Flipgrid or any other kind of tool that really encourages collaboration and communication, there are so many tools to really harness the power of the web, and there are millions of learning opportunities out there with vetted websites from you know, National Geographic, the Smithsonian, um, Getty Museum, and they're all stepping up to the plate to really help guide us uh, and to give us educational opportunities to engage our students and engage our parents with learning as well. Thank you very much um, for that response. Um, and kind of the next question kind of 
lends into that a little bit. But overall, um, I know we've been discussing a lot about how online education has really been focused more around the higher education realm. The research um, focuses a lot more on adult learners. Obviously, understanding that online education has been in the higher education um, system for years now. So Dr. Sally Brown, in your expert opinion, what aspects or experiences of online learning in higher education settings can actually be transitioned and adopted into K through 12 online learning programs? I've been teaching online for about 10 years in higher education, and I've been um, working with classroom teachers to help integrate technology into the classroom. And one of the things I can say is valuing authentic learning opportunities. So I think when we ask students to do authentic learning, no matter the age group, they're more likely to engage and take something meaningful away from the experience. If we just simply give students busy work, they see that as busy work, they don't engage, and therefore they're not learning. And so I definitely recommend um, thinking about authenticity and how meaningful it is to their own lives and making cultural and personal connections. And then another recommendation that I have is to break learning into small segments that come together for a whole. And what I mean by that is to create a five minute mini lesson about a particular aspect of content that you want students to learn. That way they can view that video, they can look at it multiple times, they can think about it and come back to it. When we divide learning segments online into lengthier portions, students don't always listen to the whole video or watch it. And so those smaller pieces are gonna be more manageable for students. And then the third thing that I'd like to recommend is to use screen capture software. Right now, Screencast-O-Matic is offering um, their program free for educators. And for students, especially students that don't have a lot of experience with online tools, by you recording um, the exact steps by recording your screen, it gives students a complete picture. Oh, this is what my teacher means. This is what I'm supposed to do. And that can help clarify issues for students whether they're graduate students or third grade students trying to complete assignments online. Switching gears a bit to focus on K through 12 support systems. Dr. Che Blankson, in your expert opinion, how can school administrators and leadership better support teachers in the midst of the significant transition from traditional learning to remote and or online learning? What kind of resources can you recommend? Well, we know the school um, administrator is the instructional leader. And so an instructional leader needs to have knowledge of what their teacher's strengths and what their needs are um, in order to know how best to support them. Um, so this instructional leader also has to know how to maintain a positive culture. You know, with um, what is going on with COVID right now, um, guidelines are changing by the minute. So the instructional leader should be the one who is knowledgeable about all these guidelines and be able to communicate them effectively and quickly with their teachers. Um, the um, school administrator as the instructional leader should also know about teaching and technology resources. So for example, what would the teachers need for you know, video conferencing, if that's what the teacher would want to use in their classroom. Um, what would the teacher need for collaborative activities, right? So what kinds of software um, and um, information is out there about how that can be used in for K to 12 learning? Um, you know, if you want to poll your students, if you want to do interactive activities, what can the teacher use? And so that um, the um, administrator then becomes sort of like a resource for the, the teachers. Um, not only that, but the administrator has to be the one who is going to be supporting the emotional needs of the teachers. And how do they do that, right? How do they go about 
knowing what is going on with it, um, in their teacher's life, what their needs are at any particular moment and how to be able to support that. Um, the administrative um, leader also works in a community, so they have to know about their families and the community members, what are their needs. Um, I will share one thing that my um, school district is doing. The leaders in the school districts are taking care of things like just, you know, breakfast in, in the morning for their kids and lunches, right, uh, making those available to families who are in need. And this is something that the instructional leader needs to be able to provide to the community as well as to the families that are they are serving. Um, and so this individual or whoever the, the school administrator is should be able to support not only the teachers and the staff, but also the community as well as the families that they serve. Um, keeping in touch, making sure that they are communicating everything and dispelling all the information that they don't need, um, the families and the constituents don't need to um, have any knowledge about. And um, so then again, things like, you know, continuing things like PBIS within schools, how do they um, keep um, awarding their students who are doing good work, um, even though they are learning remotely? How do they reward their teachers who are doing good work, who, even though they are teaching remotely? And these are some of the things that the school leaders need to continually do, even though they have transitioned from a face-to-face -face setting into an online setting. Right. And then in the similar breadth of the support systems, um, Dr. Sistick Chandler, in your expert opinion, what role do professional groups, advocacy groups and funding agencies and even the government play in helping schools, administrators and teachers at the K through 12 level transition from traditional to online teaching settings? I see that professional organizations and government agencies like the Center for School Reform, uh, CASEL, which is the Association for uh, and Collaborative for S Social and Emotional Learning, the National Education Association, NEA, and other national councils who really are in the business of being subject matter experts. Uh, like the Council of Teachers of Mathematics, they've had a web presence for years and many teachers have looked to their websites to really be able to, to take advantage of all of the wonderful resources that they have built that are in many cases uh, video based. Um, in some cases, there are a lot of games that have been created. Um, I'm thinking about illuminations like the Council for Teacher of Mathematics and looking at uh, the Council for uh, Teachers of English, they have this incredible site called Read, Write and Think. And there's a comic strip generator and uh, uh, just lots of really great interactive tools that can be used. And most of all, what I'm observing that's being created to assist educators are really numerous web resources and websites that point to quality subject matter content. The delivery method, a lot of these have been in place already, like Google Classroom, Seesaw, Class Dojo, Edmodo, and other kinds of platforms that are really a repository or like a container of to hold all of these great web resources. And as I've shared before, it's really so important to have these resources so that they are structured, that there's a purpose why we have them listed for our students. Um, a lot of companies have really stepped up to offer free resources for the next 60 or 90 days. Zoom is one of the, the resources. Um, and um, they typically may charge subscriptions to their websites, particularly those who have been deliverers of, of uh, content that is aligned to national and state standards. Um, the EdTech Digest has a repository of these tools and you can access them. And I also see lots of really great 
web information coming out from state departments of education and school districts who have stepped up, come on deck, and they've created a web repository. They've had videos that they've archived there of uh, direct teaching and um, best practices and just, you know, they've really opened up their doors and made sure that the delivery of this content is there. But you know, the the virtual school has been around for a long time. As a matter of fact, there are 24 states who have virtual schools in act action that are free public education websites. So take a look at what Florida Virtual School has done, what Wisconsin has done, Utah, Michigan, Vir Virginia, and Pennsylvania have done. Um, and this whole area of online learning and blended learning has been studied for, you know, for, for almost 20 years, formerly by INACOL, now the Aurora Institute, um, how there are public schools and schools across the world that have been using online learning, uh, not only for supplemental use, but also exclusively for the delivery of, of content. So, you know, in a nutshell, I think that, that there are so many resources. It's which ones are the best. Um, I would highly recommend that people look at their local school districts and look at county offices of education, boards of education, um, and also state resources that have been developed that have excellent curriculum, excellent content, and in many cases they are aligned to state and national standards and also aligned to a lot of great video resources that are free. Thank you. And I know another big topic um, that we've been seeing all over forums, also in discussions with a lot of our editors and educators. Um, you know, obviously teachers are being challenged with suddenly shifting to this new online only environment um, and providing their resources solely online. But one big topic that keeps coming up again and again is accessibility and inclusivity. And the fact that, you know, with the sudden shift and with educators really focusing on making sure that everything's solely online, making sure that their resources are truly accessible to their students. So Dr. Epler, I know the majority of your research focuses on these topics. So I wanted to get your opinion um, for students who have special needs, ESL or gifted, what recommendations do you have for adequately building an online curriculum that is supportive of all their educational needs? Thank you. Um, my background is in specifically special education, so I will focus on that. The short answer is to ask the student, how best will they learn in this online environment? Some of our students with exceptionalities are visual learners, others are auditory learners. So if they are an auditory learner, uh, there's free resources like Bookshare, where the student can listen to books auditorily, they can listen to them online. Uh, if the student is a uh, visual learner using something like the virtual manipulative library, which again is also free, uh, they could learn to do, the teacher could do a lesson and then they could uh, manipulate the whatever lesson they're doing online for them. So that would be two good ways. But asking the student how they learn. A lot of our students too with exceptionalities do not have a very long attention span uh, depending on the student and their age. So maybe as was again mentioned previously, uh, breaking lessons into, we call it chunking, breaking them into smaller parts would also benefit our students that have special needs. Lastly, a question for all of our panelists. What new online trends do you foresee for the remaining academic year as well as the up upcoming academic year? Okay, so when I think about the new online learning trends, um, one of the concerns that I have is about um, lots of sites that offer um, free um, free tools like Flipgrid, and I'm worried that some of those sites may um, start to charge because they see it as a business opportunity, and so that's one of the concerns I have about the future. Um, and then also my other concern being a literacy person is the one-on-one um, -on -one reading instruction that needs to occur with young readers 
to help them um, move forward in actual um, the reading process and um, how will that look um, in this e-learning environment? How can we provide more one-on-one -on -one opportunities for students? Okay, thank you very much. And then um, we'll go ahead and then move on to um, Dr. Che Bl Blanks. I'm sorry, Dr. <laughs> See, I need to re-record too sometimes. Um, let me make sure I'm saying this right. <laughs> um, Che Blankson. Okay, wonderful. All right, so next we'll move on to Dr. Che Blankson. Well, one of the trends that I see happening going forward, and I know this is not going to be anything, uh, you know, surprising to anyone, is in, you know, technology training and training on how to, you know, develop courses online, how to um, design courses um, or, you know, um, how teachers are going to be prepared to teach online. So I can see professional development happening massively um, and that, you know, the professional development is, um, uh, I envision it and I don't know why I think about it this way, but I envision it to be one of them, you know, those things that are almost like a fire drill thing. Are we prepared to handle something like this in another crisis, right? Are you ready to go? Are you um, ready to do this, right? So then each and every time teachers won't be asked to demonstrate or to show that they are prepared to teach online as well as to teach in traditional um, settings. Um, so we would have um, this go even all the way through the teacher training programs where they're not only going to be introduced to different technologies, but they are also going to be introduced to how to design your, um, your teaching, right? How to prepare to um, teach online. And, you know, when it comes to online teaching, you have to be in that moment. You have to have that experience. And so I think that's what our teachers are going to need. And I think that's what our um, instructional leaders, being the school administrators, are going to make available to the teachers. Okay. And then um, Dr. Epler. One of my concerns, again, coming from a special ed background, is um, we're going to go back to the type of instruction where we thought that one way to instruct, we used only one way to instruct all students. I don't know that just teaching online is going to benefit our students with special needs. Uh, I envision more of a hybrid type situation where perhaps, you know, part of the day the students are in the classroom or every other day, whatever, you know, is decided that is best. Uh, given the current situation, and then part of their lessons are uh, online. Um, I agree with Dr. Brown, teaching, you know, reading to a student one-on-one -on -one online probably is not the best situation. However, maybe something like a math class would lend itself more to a uh, online situation. So I, I am concerned that we are going back to the, we are only going to instruct students one way when um, you know, we have a variety of learning styles and, and learning preferences within a classroom. And I just, I hope that we will continue to figure out different ways to instruct all the various students um, so that everybody learns. Everybody, it's a more of a level playing field, if you will. I was going to say, definitely, um, everyone's brought up, you know, very interesting points overall and, you know, wanting to make an inclusive and diverse learning environment, obviously, with the dual online and then also um, within the classroom. Then Dr. Sistic Chandler. Thank you for asking, because I really look at what has been happening um, K-12 for the last few years, and I always refer to the Horizon Report by Educause. And they state that there's lots of things going on that are new and emerging trends like artificial intelligence, um, augmented reality, um, using robotics, using coding, and constructing knowledge through a variety of tools and simulations. Um, the trend that I see that is most prevalent is combining face-to-face -face with online whether it's through flipped learning and having teachers record lessons, record 
uh, presentations and having those readily available after school, uh, that is certainly one way to continue learning. And this is a contingency. It's not just a contingency anymore. It really is being able to have school, hate to say it, 24 seven, that you have resources that are vetted, that are verified, that are curated, and having students have the ability to look at those after school, after we're back to school in a face-to-face -face environment. I also see that one-to-one -one learning is going to be very prevalent. Um, many school districts went ahead and purchased Chromebooks and other devices that are rather inexpensive and they were easy to deploy. But one issue that I think is, is part of the puzzle and that is having internet access. There were really creative school districts that drove their buses out to rural communities to offer online and internet access, but I think that's gonna be the biggest impediment is the internet is still not 100% accessible to students in their homes um, and nor are is the internet available 24 seven to rural communities across the United States as well as worldwide. So the access to the internet I think is critical we did a great job in offering ENET through the US Department of Education and the Communications Division of the FCC. E-rate allowed districts to use special funds to purchase internet access for uh, schools, but that money is no longer available. So that's what I see as the impediment, but definitely having internet available web resources 24 seven for all students in a face-to-face -face and an online environment. Okay, I want to just close out the question and answer portion of this of this seminar. And just first and foremost, thank all of our panelists for their time to get today um, to discuss these really pertinent topics. Um, obviously, this just scratches the surface of a lot of what educators are facing specifically in K through 12. Um, online learning environments. And we completely understand that this is a continually evolving field of research. Um, and there's an apparent need in seeing to provide resources to K through 12 educational professionals. And based on this, IJ Global is actually offering our K through 12 online learning ebook collection. To tell you a little bit about this collection, it's an ebook collection that contains over 280 titles. Um, they've actually been hand selected by our expert editorial team on topics including but not limited to blended blended and mobile learning educational administration curriculum development instructional design administration and leadership teacher education and special education really focusing in on those k-12 through online learning environments to ensure that institutions are able to access these resources, we're actually offering a limited time, highly competitive introductory price of $975. So 50% off the original retail price, which makes it as low as $4 per publication. Um, like I said, this is a really exclusive price that is highly competitive in the field. And this is ultimately because we want the resources to be made available to those who can ultimately benefit from it. Um, to tell you a little bit more to these resources within this collection have actually been contributed by leading international professors, deans, and educators, specifically within um, K through 12 online learning environments or with research in that field. Um, that also includes our editors and authors that we had speak today on our seminar. And I'm just gonna give them a little bit of time just to talk down through the publications, explain exactly why their titles are so per pertinent and important, especially in the time that we live in um, with online only environments and this overall shift to online learning. This book is on the various levels service delivery models within special education programs. Uh, ideally, we would like every student to be in an inclusion classroom. Um, and that can take on many, many forms. It could be where the general education teacher and the special education teacher or intervention specialist are working side by side. They're doing some form of a co-teaching model. Or it could be where the general education teacher is instructing everyone, including students that have an exceptionality. Um, 
We are trying very, very hard to get away from the model where the students are excluded um, and have them in the classroom as much as possible. Um, we are also pushing, and currently in my state where I am working, we are working towards having a dual program where our intervention specialists not only are experts in children that have exceptionalities, but they also are going to be trained in a content area. Because one of the things that we find is that when our intervention specialists go into the into a, um, an inclusion classroom, a lot of times they know how to do the strategies for to help our students with exceptionality, but they don't know the content. So these programs will help with that and enhance the inclusion experience for all the students, not even the student, not necessarily, I should say, the students who have an identified special need, but for students who may be at risk and just need that extra assistance. Okay, my work has been um, in elementary classrooms, looking at um, how uh, technology interfaces with literacy learning, um, especially with diverse students, um, including English learners. And so this publication is really perfect for COVID-19 in that it demonstrates five years worth of work research in the areas of graphic stories and digital writing in the cloud, poetry in motion, um, and digital play, um, all as they unfold in early childhood classrooms. And so it provides some real practical applications, um, specific tools that can be used by teachers in classrooms, and what kind of results they can expect, um, how um, the students featured in the book were able to become um, better readers and writers, how they were able to de um, develop identities um, that establish their confidence, and how through the use of digital play that they were able to learn and use new tools that maybe people thought um, that early childhood students wouldn't be able to navigate. And it shows the strengths of the students. And if we just listen and pay attention, they will help lead us in the right direction. Well, this is one of the um, books, I'll, I'll, I'll start by saying that my um, research has to do with the use of technology um, in teaching and learning in K through 20 um, systems um, and um, also in online education. I have also um, written a few um, publications on blended learning um, as that is the um, trend I believe that we will be going um, into pretty soon. Um, and so this book was um, written and it contains um, you know, information from several authors who have the skill or who have the experience with uh, blended learning. And it's not only for educators in the US, but it is for, you know, this is from global um, knowledge. So in individuals from different schools, international regions have also contributed to um, this product. And um, they share their wisdom or they share their experiences with using different emerging tools or emerging techniques for uh, being able to conduct teaching and learning in blended classrooms from you know um, k through 12 schools as well as at the university and college level thank you so much for the opportunity the book was just released and it is a compilation of work from very seasoned, experienced online educators who through their experiences have been able to examine how synchronous, which is real-time communication, real-time delivery of information has really been a method that because of the uh, ability to have web conferencing software, uh, 
is really been a great way to connect with students. So we wanted a way to, through the lens of both of those mediums or both of those methodologies, both synchronously and asynchronously, look at the best of both worlds and to see how our resources and our practices really support those two modes. Um, the, the book is, like I said, a compilation of very experienced uh, doctoral uh, uh, colleagues who have been working online for a long time. We have uh, examined the use of, of e-portfolios. We have looked at uh, a, a system called Precision Learning, which is the new version of computer-based training where we're using online methods to develop pathways and just-in-time learning that's customized and personalized because of artificial intelligence um, built in the system, delivering education uh, that's personalized to that individual student um, through the Precision Learning Institute at National University. There's also been this big debate about is, what method is better synchronous instruction or asynchronous um, instruction. And really, uh, the, the book really shows that there's power in both, uh, as well as what it takes to transition from a completely synchronous or a face-to-face -face environment, and how a doctoral program was moved to online, and how a counseling program for school counselors was moved from a strictly face-to-face -face environment to a blended environment. Um, the power of communication and engagement with online tools has really grown uh, tremendously. Now with Web 3.0 and having a lot of data analytics and other types of systems provide us with real-time data, this, this study in this field is only going to continue to grow. So along with um, all of the comments that our editors just gave on their titles, our collection also includes some of IGI Global's best-selling titles as well from other editors and authors that weren't necessarily a part of the seminar. Um, that includes the Handbook of Research on Diverse Teaching Strategies for the techn Technology-Rich Classroom. This is by one of our prominent editors, Dr. Lawrence Tomei, who's an Associate Provost for the Academic Affairs and a Professor in Education at Robert Morris University, and Dr. David Carbonara, who is a Clinical Assistant Professor of Education and Director of the Program in Instructional Technology at Duquesne University. We also have another title, Handbook of Research on Virtual Training and Mentoring, uh, of online instructors. This is by Dr. Jerry Keenway. He's a professor and coordinator of elementary education programs at University of North Dakota. And he's published numerous IGI Global titles. And also he has actually put his research into practice and also helps mentor some of our current educated, education editors and authors um, in producing additional content within this space. We have the Handbook of Research on Building, Growing, and Sustaining Quality E-Learning Programs. This is by Dr. K. Sheldon. He's an online education consultant and associate professor at Lamar University. And his co-editor, um, Dr. Karen Penderson, she is the Dean of Kansas State University's Global Campus and formerly was the Chief Knowledge Officer for the Online Learning Consortium in the United States. Another title, one of our best-selling titles, is actually the Handbook of Research on Emerging Practices and Methods for K-12 Online and Blended Learning. And this is by Dr. Tina Lane Hefner, who's a professor at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Her co-editors include Dr. Richard Hartshorn, who's an associate professor at the University of Central Florida, and Dr. Richard Threat, who is also an adjunct professor at the University of Central Florida. So as you can see, this collection has been put together and includes research from leading educators within their specific fields, specifically in the area of K through 12 education, making this a collection really pivotal for K through 12 institutions, educators and deans, educational consultants, 
school administrators, researchers, and educational professionals, and even looking at public libraries who support their K through 12 school systems. Um, it is hosted on IGI Global State of the Art Emphasi platform, which provides features that make it super user friendly, including no DRM or no digital rights management, which essentially allows users to copy and paste and print directly from the platform. It has no maintenance of service fees. All the resources are available in PDF or HTML format. And then obviously there will be virtual access options available um, for institutions as well. With that and being access options and focusing on those access access options, we do offer a multitude of access options, including integrating it into the institution's library system um, or even making it available through IP authentication. So really making this an ideal resource for professional development um, for K through 12 educational professionals. Um, ultimately, it provides the latest resources to help them navigate through this new era of teaching and this new online learning environment. So for more information regarding this collection, pricing, access options, or even to continue the discussion that we had here today, feel free to contact IGI Global's um, database team at eResources at IGIGlobal.com or 717-533-8845, um, or visit our website at www.igiglobal.com backslash eResources. Mm -hmm.